Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our panel discussion. So, Kevin, why don't you kick us off? All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm from America Makes, Director of Technology Transition. America Makes is a, um, about three years old now and is going through some exciting changes in that um, the, the technology that's been developed over the last three years is now reaching the point where it's, it's um, able to be uh, exploited and commercialized. But I think the important part is what's next. Um, it's not too late to be involved. It's not too late to, uh, to be part of the network. It's not too late to, to jump in. Um, and I'd, I'd like to use the, the um, rapid conference as an opportunity to re reintroduce America Makes to those of you who perhaps were interested a couple of years ago, um, you know, kicked the tires a little bit, and, and, and are possibly interested in re-engaging. Um, with respect to transition, um, I, it's a privilege to be up here um, with represent, you know, two great representatives of two great organizations. Um, and, and as mentioned, you know, with GE uh, introducing what they've what, what they've done, um, it's it, it kind of serves as the the shining city on the hill for the um, for the industry as a whole. And we need that to succeed uh, to 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 be able to you know, strive the rest of us toward that. Um, the the important element of, of of what GE's doing and those who are who are transitioning to this technology successfully is recognizing that it's not necessarily just uh, technology development that matters. What matters is capability development. Um, it's, it's all of the ancillary things that support the additive technology that is what has, has made what GE and others have done um, successfully um, as, as, a, as unique as it is. Um, and the ancillary technologies are, are, are everything from IT to um, to training, workforce, um, and so forth, but all of the things that together support the inclusion of additive in your portfolio of technologies. Um, so that's, I think it's a, the important point, I think, is capability development. Thank you, Kevin. Barbara. Hi, my name is Barbara Negroi. Um, I am with GE Corporate. Most recently, uh, I worked to open up the Pittsburgh facility, our kind of multimodal corporate additive facility in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, GE transitions parts to production every day, uh, and it's always hard. Even when you're in a technology that you have some familiarity with, um, and you're just trying to qualify a new part geometry, it's tough. It's always tough. You know, additive is a different new technology, new-ish, yet it's the same in many ways when you're talking about transitioning it to production. Uh, we still care about, you know, part-to-part -part variation and being able to lock in a parameter set and get the same part every time. You know, when you uh, develop a part and you want to put it into production, you are ensuring to your technology teams that they're going to get a quality part every time and to your plants and supply chain teams that they have an opportunity for success. So, you know, creating one part in a lab and getting it qualified as part of a total system is impressive. But once that happens and you are now in the system, you have to mass produce and you have to get that part transitioned to production. And that's, you know, that's hard, like I said before, um, just like in any other technology. So once you start doing that, you say, uh, now I'm worried about, or I start thinking about uh, machine cycle time, because that's a direct correlation to my investment dollars that I'm going to spend to get this process and these parts up and running. Then I start thinking about environmental health and safety. You know, what's required to run these machines, uh, what's required throughout the process. I start thinking about material handling. So not just pricing availability, but material handling in and out of the machines and how easy or difficult is that. You know, and I start thinking about how can I manage these printers along with the other machines that are required to produce additive parts, so post-processing inspection, as part of my total plant, and actually be able to use those investments as, as wisely as I can and manage my plant. So machine connectivity is very important, along with being able to incorporate them in some of your existing MES and ERPs in your plant that you already have. 
um, just by some tweaks. So yes, it's, it's hard, but I know we can do it, um, and we will do it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Leo, how about your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Um, I am an optimist. Uh, I look at uh, additive manufacturing as the technology for the next century. Uh, subtractive manufacturing was part of the previous century. By the way, Boeing will be uh, um, celebrating its 100th year anniversary in July. So as we move forward, uh, additive manufacturing is part of our plan for that. Additive manufacturing to me, and what's exciting to see, uh, Todd's presentation, uh, so exciting, is it's an ecosystem. It's a, it's a large ecosystem that is necessary to take these innovations into production, into repeatable production. But um, lest you think that additive manufacturing is new, let me just tell you that today, as, as I sit here before you, uh, the Boeing company has, has more than 20,000 parts. You heard me right, 20,000 parts additively produced, additively manufactured parts flying today, as, as we speak today. And it's many more than 20,000, but that's all I can tell you. <laughs> um, um, in addition to that, we have had uh, a titanium structural metal part flying on aircraft since 2003. 2003, titanium 6-4 structural member flying. And that part was not put on the aircraft to show the demonstrator technology. It bought its way onto the aircraft, just like everything else. You cannot introduce technology just for the sake of, te of, um, of its sake. So that particular part was designed and manufactured, produced by additive manufacturing, and bought its way, and it's been flying for 12 years, and it has been in production for that time. So additive manufacturing is new, but it's not that new. Additive manufacturing has been around. If you've flown on a, a 787, that's a composite aircraft. It's made pre preg layer, one layer at a time. Eight automatic fiber place AFP machines are, play, are making every fuselage, 400 aircraft in the air today, made layer by layer. So additive manufacturing has been around, and we need to take advantage of that whole ecosystem that makes production repeatable and cost affordable. And as I'm here today, as I'm here today and, and I talk to an, a large number of you in the past and I hope in the future, I see four key main areas that, that need to be worked and, and that I know are being worked and we need to bring them together. The first is the machines. We've heard something from Todd about that. There's a wonderful churning and, and new ideas of machines that are coming along. The second area is materials, another set of... Just because materials have existed for the old technologies, perhaps we need new materials for the new technology. The third major uh, level of uh, uh, technology element to me is the processing windows, what I call the processing windows, the settings, the parameters, all that stuff. And that varies from machine to machine, but, but we can understand it. And finally, I think probably one of the most critical aspects of the additive manufacturing is the design for additive manufacturing. And I'll mm. stop at this point. The design for additive manufacturing is critical. Very rarely does additive manufacturing uh, substitute one for one for an existing part. It's invariably, in my experience, more expensive to do it that way. And part that you've designed for subtractive manufacturing very rarely makes the business case for additive manufacturing. So we have to learn to design for additive manufacturing. We have to learn to design to exploit the attributes of manufacturing. So as I look here into this forum and others, I look for the educational train, for training and retraining. Remember, our engineers have a lifetime of 40 work lifetime of 40 years. Just because they came out of university 40 years ago, they need to be retrained to use, they, they've, they've had it in their minds to design parts that you, you machine. Now we have to retrain those people. So as I look at the academic institutions, up and down, community colleges, whatever, we have to train and retrain our people for that. 
We, just like CNC machines, we have to train operators to run that, the connectivity, the security that goes with that. Lots of challenges, but lots of exciting challenges. So with that, thank Good. you. Good, thank you, Leo. And, and let me, actually, so first of all, let's thank our, our panelists for that Good kickoff there. So in fact, I'll, I'll correct Leo. He said our, our engineer's gonna be in there for 40 years. Our, our, our engineers are finishing up now at the age of 20, 22 years old. I'm looking at my social security information that says I'm retiring at about 70. So I'm thinking 50 years, <laughs> so half a century. Uh, and think about, I'm coming out of automotive sector. Think about what the car looked like 50 years ago in 1966, uh, ancient technology. So that retraining and training is, is critical. And I would say not only that, Right, as we look at it, designing for additive manufacturing, but what we're really looking at, and this is why the tools that we saw earlier today, right, there you are, uh, you know, are so critical. It's not just additive, it's not just subtractive, but we need to teach our engineers to think across the entire spectrum, leveraging additive where it makes sense, leveraging our more traditional processes where they make sense, and then to be able to actually, you know, to, to move forward because I guarantee you in another five or 10 years, we will have other processes. So how do we rapidly integrate those into our value stream and production lines? Um, so anyways, we have, some great, uh, we have some great questions. And so um, let's start with some, some of the more general questions here. Um, basically, um, and I, I think sort of a nice one to kick off on, you, you know, and anybody, we'll just ask for one person to respond here. Uh, anybody think that additive manufacturing is just gonna take over everything and we're gonna replace all of our traditional manufacturing processes? Never. No. Never. Okay. Kevin, how about it? Just a quick two second, you know, 30 second on that one. No, the factory of the future, just as, as Leo is saying, the factory of the future incorporates the best of all of these things and, and recognizing where additive fits is, the, is an important piece of the puzzle. Designing for additive is critical. Um, the, 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 the design engineer that is currently six years old sitting, you know, playing Minecraft is thinking about things in a different way than, than the rest of us thought of as we were, as we were coming through school. Um, being able to think in three dimensions is something that's not a, um, just given to you. Um, it, you they have to, they're practicing it. They're going to come up with some things that are really cool, right? And, and that's happening more and more all the time. But that's going to lead to custom products, it's going to lead to um, you know, very unique geometries, unique applications, and so forth. But fundamentally, the things that we need and use every day, the, there, you know, there are a lot of things that are not going to be made at, in, in an additive. We're, uh, we're not going to make some, we're not going to make a new fork because our fork is dirty. Using additive is going to cost way too much money and always will. Um, but the, um, you know, the, 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 the Technology continues to grow, continues to expand, um, and I, I don't think we've come anywhere close to where the potential is. But I'd, great in our lifetime, I don't that, see that happening. So, and I think that was sort of a kind of a nice slow ball. And, and the next one actually mm -hmm. comes comes for e either either you know Barbara or or uh, or Leo. Um, number one is what, what were sort of the, the the management changes that had to be made to really get additive moving, and what were some of the technical hurdles that you had to overcome. Either one, or actually, I'd like to hear from both of you because you have a little bit different approaches there. Yeah, I'll, I mean, the first part of that is um, it really just it took some inquisitive people. You know, some like you said, tech, uh, additive has been around for for a long time. Like that's why I said it's new-ish. You know, it's been around for um, for quite a while. And those people who did work in additive and started with, you know, the, the polymer piece and started working through it were not doing a lot of the mainstream things that, you know, a, a lot of other people were doing. And they were seeing things out there. They were talking to people. They were making prototypes in the evenings and showing it to their boss and, you know, trying to get stuff pushed through and approved. Um, and, and so that's, that's, I think that's one a huge piece is, you know, not engineer not every engineer is the same, not every person's the same. You have to have that inquisitive nature to get into it and really kind of find something that, especially with big companies, that the leadership team can kind of grab a hold of and then start to have some, um, some interest in. And then it takes the, um, you know, the leaders to kind of go out on a limb for some of those first few parts and say, I know that we don't have great regulations around it yet, but I see something here, um, let's give it a shot. You know, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a new technology, but let's do it. 
I, I believe in this, let's give it a try. And you kind of have to have that to, to get the ball rolling. Leo? Yeah, very similar for us too. I mean, it takes those innovators and the, the folks, uh, at least I believe that they show the passion, they're passionate and they show uh, and they will relentlessly uh, push those of us in, in, in a sort of decision-making positions to, to, to listen to them and to hear their ideas. Now, how does the management itself respond to this? We, um, we're very deliberate about holding what we call um, uh, a set of investments that we make in, our, uh, uh, in the company that we call protecting the future. You know, we live in a very competitive environment, a very tough environment, and, uh, but yet, you know, the management chain, and I, I give all credit to, to my superiors on this, they're willing to invest in what we call protecting the future, in, in a series of technologies that, that support that. And for additive manufacturing, and for the part that I spoke of earlier the, uh, on the Titanium 6.4, it took a lot of, a lot of nurturing and a lot of uh, trust from the chief engineers and, and the leadership to, to allow that to happen. And, but you only do that once. And, and, and let me just say this, that for all the excitement that's going on in 3D right now, I'll tell you what my biggest fear is. My biggest fear is the hype. We are at the height of the hype curve right now. And any one of you and any one of us, I'll just tell you, we bear the responsibility not to overhype it. Because one bad step, one misstep from any one of us, and one, uh, uh, you know, one e event, one incident, and the technology will be set back 10 years. Uh, so our management, certainly with, within our company, is very, we, we trust our technical leadership team and, and, and our technical evaluators. But we want to be deliberate. But, but deliberate, I mean fast moving and forward looking. But we need to be thoughtful. So, you know, I would I tell my my team that, you know, bad news doesn't get better with time. So the first thing that you have an issue, you need to tell me. And the second thing is, do not overpromise because if you overpromise and underdeliver, the technology will take a setback. So we we in this community, the additive manufacturing community, and the uh, you know and, and the associated areas, whether it's the design, the communication. Do not fall prey to the hype, mm -hmm. because if you do, that will be a significant impediment to the, to the implementation of the technology. The universities and everybody else will still be working, but the implementation of the technology will get pushed back if we yield to the hype. Agreed. So, cautionary Agreed. note. No, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> so let me... Let me um, shift gears just a little bit um, and, and talk about, uh, there's a really nice question here, GE and Boeing and, and Kevin, I think with, with America Makes, of course, you, you see a lot of this as well, so anybody feel free to jump into this one. As, as uh, AM technology is adopted in product, uh, how does that, um, how do the suppliers respond and you know, what kind of changes do you see in, in your supply chains and so forth? Let me take a, a, a crack at that first. So uh, today Boeing, the Boeing company employs 152,000 people in the United States. Uh, its extended supply base, 1.5 million people, we estimate, in the United States. Now, that supply base, to us, it's part of our production system, okay? So it is no good for us to be cognizant and expert uh, in additive manufacturing with the Boeing company if our production system isn't. So we have a great deal of interest in the supply chain, the smaller shops, first tier, second, third tier shops, being cognizant and expert and able to exploit additive manufacturing. Because you know what? We spent $50 billion a year in that supply chain. Boeing is a $100 billion company, close to a relatively small company in the bigger scheme of things. But half of our work is done outside, 50 billion. So we need those folks to be, to be connected. That's why America Makes and other, and other uh, collaboration institutions, uh, including us and me, um, are very important in stitching that ecosystem together. 
So we have a great deal of interest in the education and training going beyond the Boeing company, but sharing it with Ecostructure. I mean, we, we see the supply chain not just in, you know, changing not just in additive, but in our, you know, we have the digital thread, brilliant factory push for ourselves as well. And that kind of feeds into additive on this connectivity, on pu pushing your files through and then getting them back. Um, you know, there's a lot of growth to be had in being able to trans transfer files and stop some of these steps. Um, you know, the, the CAD to CAM, then back to inspection. You know, that all flows through, um, you know, not specifically to additive, but in some ways. Uh, and so, you know, our, our supply chain is growing, and then in some areas we're getting more specific with our, with our standards and trying to, um, you know, get those supply chains learning with us. It's, it's not that, you know, we know everything and we're trying to get everybody up to speed with us. We're all learning at the same time. And so it's an interesting environment where we see some people, you know, teaching us and then us teaching them. Just as a follow on that, I really want to use you. And then I have one uh, as we get down to some of the quality stuff for, for, for Kevin. Um, what about the sort of the build versus buy, right? So, so how do you make the decision of, because uh, if I could just 3D print, right? I mean, the idea, of course, and I think, again, I, I say this with, with Leo's caution about be careful what you say, right? But okay, we click the print button and there we have our part. So why would you buy it, you know, or why would you, you know, do it in-house versus just going out to, to uh, you know, a, 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 an additive manufacturing shop or a 3D print shop? Any thoughts along those lines in terms of where it might go yeah, and how some of those first. decisions are made? Well, I know at GE, um, we, you have IP concerns, and then you have quality, mm -hmm. very strict quality standards. So there aren't a lot, and I'm talking mostly metal. I mean, mo mostly metal is, is, is what I'm talking about. Um, there aren't just shops you can go out. There are some, but not really shops you can go out and just say, I want that, I want that, give it to me. Um, and so since we're learning ourselves, that's you know, the whole purpose of our center in Pittsburgh is you know, to, to really grow our own knowledge of knowing what to ask for, building should cost models to understand what it should cost, um, and, and better, but understanding how we do that, buying part into a system. Because no business is going to just go additive regardless of what, you know, what it costs, what it means just to do it. Um, it still has to buy its way in. And um, there's variables that go into that should cost model. And those specific variables are what you kind of start drilling down on and trying to optimize so that the overall cost gets in control and that you better understand your process. So um, for us, we like, we like to make. That's what we're doing right now, um, especially in additive, because it is such a new technology and you have things like FAA and regula regulatory agencies that um, to put that onus on someone else is, uh, could be a risk. So that's where we're kind of focused right now. Yeah, for us, I would say we are data driven. Um, we're just open to, you know, each case is evaluated on its own merits. The clearly, uh, you know, in, in, in our world, in aerospace world and commercial aerospace, defense, satellites, helos, I mean, we do the whole lot, we even build a submarine. Um, so in all of these cases, you know, quality is really the driver. And, and, and one of the issues really with additive manufacturing is stability of processes. You know, it's wonderful to see the evolving machines, but stability is also very important. So, so in, in, in areas where the design and the specific design represents the, the largest value proposition for us, the decision tends to get biased towards internal make. When the, the, the design isn't so critical, or the parts are perhaps not so critical, the, then the, in general, these are broad generalizations, that then we go into the buy mode. But in every case, in every case, let me just stress to you that it, we're data driven. In each case, as like I mentioned before in the part that, that we, the, the, the titanium part that I spoke of, of 2003, you know, it was a decision, it won its way on the aircraft. It did not, it was not put there to show, to demonstrate additive manufacturing. It was driven by this business case, and that's what the way we will handle everything. So in that respect, if I go back to the earlier question a little bit, additive manufacturing is a tool. It's a process. 
It's a tool that's available to us for design and production, and it's going to compete with all of the other processes on every occasion. There's no gimmies here. You know, it's going to compete and may the best man or woman win. <laughs> you know, that's the way we look at it. Certainly, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So now, now shifting over, because I've heard the words certification, quality, inspection, metrology. So let me, let me ping you, Kevin, first on this one. I mean, what, what's going on in terms of, and by the way, this will combine a number of, clearly there's a lot of interest here coming in from the audience. By the way, thank you for the good questions. W what's going on in terms of helping, or you know, what are the hurdles you know, in terms of certification and quality and so forth, and, and what's going on to move those forward, and, and, and where do you think we're going to get to uh, in the, hopefully, not too distant future? No, and, and Ed referenced this earlier um, in, in his talk about the, the, the group that we've convened to, to work on the coordination of um, specifications and standards and so forth in the additive community. And we've, what, fortunately, we've been able to bring together um, kind of the who's who of, of that group um, from both, the, both industry and government, which is really the power of the America Makes model as it is. Um, that, that group is, is targeted to, uh, to, to work through 2016 and into 2017, report out on, um, uh, as Ed was mentioning, you know, the kind of a gap, in, a gap analysis and, um, and then work with each of those standards development organizations to, to um, uh, coordinate. So maybe, first of all, make sure that, that if there are any overlaps that they're not uh, that they're not overlapping in such a way that conflicts with one another, and then secondly, to try to reach a point where there's not quite so much overlap between the various standards, so that we can be um, broad in our, you know, in our in our ap ap applicability. It comes down to having a capability, not just an additive technology. Um, the ability, the capability of additive, en encompasses so many things besides having a machine in the corner that can print parts. In order to support companies like GE and Boeing, the supply chain or the ecosystem needs to be able to understand the capabilities that go into it that are, um, that are necessary to, to support um, you know, these, these, these significant products that, 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 that have life-changing uh, applications and potentially life-threatening applications if, um, in, you know, if, if there's a problem, which would be devastating to the additive community. If, you know, additive part leads to failure, leads to loss of life. That's um, one of the, you know, things that we all kind of stay up at night worrying doesn't happen. Um, to, to ensure that, that, you know, something like that weren't to happen, we need to understand as a community the capability that is necessary for these kinds of organizations because it's the, it's the small business and the, it's the small business that's supplying them. It's the, it's the academic community that's supplying the talent it's all of those um, key stakeholders that will help drive the, cap the additive capability in these, in these organizations. And again, capability being not just having a, a machine in the corner that makes parts, but is a machine that supports a larger manufacturing um, pro uh, system. We need to ha have the communication capabilities and, and um, we need to have you know, the workforce training that you know, organizations like America Makes are supporting, um, you know, all of these things that build up into capability that's more than just making parts. Right, and I, and I think actually it's sort of interesting, again, you get back to the subtractive, or I mean, I'm, you know, sort of machining part, right? If you say, well, all right, I'm going to machine something out of steel, I know I've got a block of steel and I know what that block looks like and sort of what its, you know, what, what, what its composition is. When you're building things up, you not only have your geometric specifications, you know, but you also have things like your material specifications, right? And so these are the things that you have to track. It's not, it's not a trivial problem, you know, it, it, you know it, it, uh, in, in, any means of the, uh, in any means of the definition. What about, what, what are you looking at in terms of, for, from the industry side, some of the metrology issues? Great, you know, I can measure the outside, come down, laser scan, and all that sort of stuff, but you have other things. Number one, even things like internal geometries, but number two was what about <clears> the material characteristics? Because, you know, on some of the, if you're looking at functionally graded materials, how are you going to know that you have the right composition in there and so forth? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the whole quality assurance issue is, is uh, you know, for my part, you know, I am looking at, um, we're looking at things like uh, in situ um, 
uh, control and, and close loop control in, in situ inspection and so on. In fact, you know, for me, it's never about non-destructive evaluation or non-destructive testing because by that time it's too late. What I really like to be at is, uh, especially in the added, and this is part of the opportunity and part of the challenge for additive manufacturing, is I don't want to know that I just made a mistake. It's too late. I've already made the mistake. I've lost my part potentially, or I have to repair it, which also costs money. What I want to know is I'm about to make a mistake. That's really the key. And the challenge that I throw out to the ch technologists here is to do that. Now, w you can set up your process parameter, and you can see when you're drifting, and with enough, you know, with the data analytics capability that we have today, one of the one of the opportunities and challenges, every one of these things, when you hear me talk about additive manufacturing, I always see it as an opportunity and a challenge. So let me t the additive manufacturing gives me more data than I ever had. I can now potentially predict with materials genome and other kinds of things, every pixel, every voxel, if you wish, in that volume, I can tell you what this microstructure is, right? I mean, if you're a metals guy, you know what I mean. So because I know the thermal profile, I know that and so on. Well, that's terabytes of data for any part. So I don't want to track all of that. It's intractable. But I may be able to track the salient features of that build process. And based on that, be able to predict that I'm drifting into a, a zone that I don't want to be in. And that, to me, is predictive process control. It's, you know, we have agents that could do that, software agents and so on. So as I step back and say, wow, is it a, a terrible problem? You know, but it isn't. It's really a tractable problem that we have to put our effort into it. I mean, I came from an agency called DARPA, and, you know, we used to brag that we invented the internet, and I guess we did. Maybe other people have the same bragging rights, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, but what did DARPA really do for, 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 for the internet revolution? You know, what DARPA at the essence did was to define TCP IP, right? They defined a communication protocol, and then everybody else put tons of money and made the internet what it is today. Yeah. And I think that's where the sort of the standards and the infrastructure comes along here. We need a way to communicate. We need a way that's efficient and standard to communicate. And there's a lot of opportunity there for collaboration across competitors, across everybody else. It, you, know, you know, we all use the same kinds of materials, we just use them differently. But we believe I, that we use them better than anybody else. And let me do, so, so actually, back to the standards thing. So there are two other questions. One's going to be specifically for Barbara. That'll be our last one. And you look like one of my students at a final exam when I say that, right? But, <laughs> but, um, but the, 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 the other one, I, I do want to hear about materials. Can you talk about, I mean, did, you know, anybody really, very shortly, because we only have a couple of minutes, um, there's a lot of questions on material. I mean, you know, what are the stumbling blocks? What do we need out of the materials manufacturers and so forth? Or are we good to go where we're at today? I'll be happy to start. Sure, fire um, off, Kevin. Building quickly off of what Leo was saying, I just wanted to add one point, is that um, as we get more and more digital in what you're describing through, through in the quality part, we, um, as an industry, we need to em embrace the uh, likelihood of, of cyber terror and cyber attacks, which would destroy, um, potentially, you know, d damage parts in, in a way that we wouldn't recognize the damage because of the cyber, you know, the cyber aspect to it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, I, I don't want to hark on that, but, you know, but I do want to point out that as we get more and more digital, the, the, the threat of cyber, cyber sure. security, cyber terrorism is a, a significant problem that we need to uh, make sure we're addressing as an industry. With respect to materials, I mean, obviously the, um, as, as the, the first present, uh, presenter today uh, showed, we're, um, you know, lots of metal, 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 um, but as we're, as we're seeing, um, a lot of excitement in the in the in the you know composites, the carbons, the in those sorts of those sorts of areas. Um, what what is really fascinating, though, is you know as you start to tweak those, and as you start to tweak them potentially through a build, um, you know having the um, the the integrated computational techniques, the ICME. Um, ICME you know, is what integrated. 
computational ma materials. Ma materials engineering. So like design your material yeah. in the computer, right? And then, you know, just off you go. So you, you, you're essentially selecting, as he said, you're selecting, all right, I want that material here to, you know, right. voxelate it. Um, enables um, the, th that's the kind of thing that's going to enable the six-year-old that I was talking about earlier, right? The, the, the kid that's working on Minecraft right now that's thinking in this third, in, in 3D yep. in such a way that none of us have the kind of, at least I don't, have the capability of doing um, that, that kind of thought process that leads to um, new, you know, new materials. And, and, and it's not necessarily even new materials, but new applications right. of Good. alloyed materials or whatever. And, and I think, so I, we do have one more question, but I, I think key thing, remember, we keep thinking about geometries. I think at least 50% of the interesting things that are going to happen out there are the materials. The, the way that we can combine materials into those crazy geometries that we're designing. So last question, I have to ask this, right, of, of Barbara, and this was a great question. I see a number of these here. We've got all these great machines, all these great systems out there, right? And you need to know that everybody here needs to know the answer, right? This is going to be sort of the value add for sticking around to the bitter end here. <laughs> so Barbara, you know, um, if you had some, like in 30 seconds or so, just some advice, right, to give to the audience here, to you know, convince their management to buy some of these systems that they're going to see today, which are so cool, what would be your advice in terms of the value proposition? Um, wh one thing that we, that we did at GE, and I know this has to be quick, but you know, when design engineers, if you have an idea, most of the vendors will make a part for you. So get your idea in place and then send it off to, to that particular, whatever machine you're looking at. We just saw that there's a ton of them. Um, and those are just the new ones, so there's lots that have been around, uh, you know, tried and true. But have them print apart for you, see what it looks like, and then take it to your management team, um, go through the testing procedures. I mean, there's going to be some stuff you have to do on your own, and it's not a trivial, <laughs> it's not a trivial pursuit, but it is well worth it. Um, and so just put your case together. There's so much information on the internet now. Um, you don't have all the information at your hands all the time. Nobody did, but you start to build it. So I, I would say that um, just start. It's, it's, it's not easy. You're not going to be done in a week, but just start gathering information, get a part printed, um, start putting it in your test, in your system, because at GE, we don't build just parts. We build systems. So whether it's a refrigerator or an engine or a turbine, um, those parts go in. So just, just start. Great. Some excellent advice from somebody who's probably learned a few lessons there. All right. Well, listen, let me uh, ask you to help me thank our panel for participating today.